Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Arthritis in the Body Managing Related Conditions webinar. My name is Robin Abri. I'm one of the directors of patient education here at the Arthritis Foundation. And I'm so glad you could join us tonight. We all know that arthritis can cause painful, swollen joints that are hard to ignore. Um, but what you might not suspect is that inflammation can also cause other arthritis related conditions. Um, our guest tonight will share tips and guidance on how to control that inflammation as well as how to stay off other conditions. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping rules about tonight's event. All attendees have been muted. You can direct any, any questions you have throughout the presentation um, on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll start with the presentation and reserve some time to answer questions at the end of your discussion, after the end of tonight's discussion. And after tonight's session, you will receive an email about your experience. These surveys help the foundation better plan for future events, so please take time to fill them out. A recording of tonight's webinar will be included in the post-event survey, um, as well as the Arthritis Foundation's YouTube channel and webinars hub. You can also view upcoming webinars, which are hosted monthly, on the webinars hub and past recordings on our YouTube channel as well. So let's introduce our guest expert tonight. Tonight's expert is Dr. Amanda Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a board certified internist and rheumatologist with a master's in clinical research and epidemiology. Her areas of interest include inflammatory arthritis, um, including rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthropathies and osteoarthritis. She spends one day a week in clinic divided between general rheumatology and musculoskeletal ultrasound and is involved in fellow education and mentoring. Dr. Nelson is also the Director of Phenotyping and Precision Medicine Resource Corps of the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for joining us tonight and um, please take it away. There are many different types of arthritis. This is just a short list of some of the ones that are focuses of the Arthritis Foundation. There are over a hundred types of arthritis, so uh, don't be upset if your specific one is not here. We'll talk through some of the aspects of some of these as they're relevant. One of the ways we differentiate types of arthritis is by how the symptoms behave and how people describe their experience with arthritis. That can help us to put things into some categories that can be useful. So very inflammatory types such as rheumatoid arthritis or some of the spondyloarthropathies generally present with prolonged stiffness, which can be an hour or more. Um, it tends to be worse in the morning, right when people wake up or even overnight and improves with activity. So once people are up and moving around, they start to feel better and loosen up. And some people are actually asymptomatic during the day when active. These types of arthritis often have swelling and warmth in the joints. They can be red and even feel hot and can present very acutely. All of a sudden, a joint is hot and red and angry, especially like in gout. And these can involve one or more joints and they can be symmetrical. Mechanical issues and osteoarthritis to a lesser extent, which is inflammatory um, for sure, but not to the extent that rheumatoid arthritis and some of the others are, have less stiffness. So there might be five, 10, 15 minutes of stiffness that tends to get worse with activity and worse at the end of the day and might um, happen when resting. So if sitting in a car or sitting in a chair for a while, um, there's this kind of short period of stiffness that occurs with that. There can be swelling, but it's generally less severe and not sort of red and warm. Um, osteoarthritis in particular is accompanied by enlargement of the bones. So the, the knee, for example, will actually get a little bigger. And this crepitus sensation, which is that popcorn kind of crunchy sound you can get when you're going up and down stairs. Um, and these types are often asymmetric, although not always. Great. So OA, as I mentioned, um, is actually my focus, so I put it first because I have prerogative. Um, but OA is a serious disease, so people sometimes think of it just as a sore knee or or something like that. It's really not. Um, it's very rapidly increasing in the population and affects more than 50 million people in the United States and more than 200 people in the world, and that's probably an underestimate in both cases. Most of these individuals have at least two up to five other chronic comorbid conditions. And these are the kinds of things we're going to talk about in this 
um, presentation, so things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And these all run together in this package of things that really makes it difficult um, to deal with any one of them, let alone all five of them at once. And gout, uh, as you heard mentioned, um, is an inflammatory arthritis that's caused by uric acid crystals, which are those really spiky looking things in the pink picture. Those are under a polarized microscope. And you can imagine that those would hurt. So essentially there's too much uric acid in the body and it precipitates, it sort of falls out into the joint and causes these flares, as you see in the picture of the big toe, uh, which our host also mentioned. The risk factors for gout include genetics. Um, it's more common in men, but can certainly happen in women, especially after menopause. Diets that are high in purine, so these tend to be red meats, um, alcohol, certainly um, some medications will precipitate gout. And the management of gout is actually through reducing the uric acid burden in the long term and treating the inflammation like this toe you see in the image here in the short term. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, we always talk about it's the most common type of autoimmune arthritis, but as I mentioned, there are dozens of these. Um, but this one affects about 1% of the population. Uh, it's more often in women, and it's usually kind of in the what we call the prime of life, right, between 30 and 50. So people often have young children, they have jobs, um, and this is the time when they get this very disabling, painful arthritis. The pattern of joint involvement um, and the prolonged stiffness, as I already mentioned, can be distinguishing factors. So you see a picture of this hand, and the, the knuckles are very swollen, and the uh, what we call the PIP joints, the next knuckle out. But by by the fingernails, that farthest out joint looks okay. And that's really common in rheumatoid arthritis. Well, it'll affect the knuckles closer into the hand, but not the ones far out by the um, fingernails. And the opposite is the case in psoriatic arthritis and osteoarthritis. So these sort of patterns of which joints are involved in when can be helpful. Rheumatoid arthritis also has blood test findings that can help us to understand what's going on. In children, we see juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which can be like RA, but it can also be like spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis or other forms. So it, it kind of has an overlap of different types. So spondyloarthritis, I've mentioned a couple times, this one often involves the spine. Um, this is different than osteoarthritis of the spine or degenerative disc disease. Again, the inflammatory versus the mechanical. Um, so this one tends to present with very inflammatory back pain, which is prolonged stiffness, um, uh, especially waking up at night and having to move around um, just to get the stiffness to ease up. These uh, folks often are better when they're at work all day, even doing like labor intensive jobs can help. Um, but there's also a peripheral pattern. And that is uh, the case that we see in psoriatic arthritis. So the other two pictures, um, first you see the gentleman kind of hunched over, that's because the spinal joints are fused. Psoriatic arthritis can present in the digits. So you see a fingernail here, and an elbow that has psoriasis rash on it. And psoriatic arthritis can act like rheumatoid arthritis, or it can act like axial spondyl arthropathy, or several things in between. And the kind of arthritis that folks with inflammatory bowel disease get can act like spondyl arthritis. So this is a group of conditions that can be very complicated. And we'll hear some more associated conditions with this in a little bit. So arthritis in general, right? We've talked about some kinds. There's a a whole bunch of other kinds we haven't talked about, but any kind of arthritis can increase the risk of obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, interestingly, um, and we'll talk about that, chronic pain in general, um, gastrointestinal issues, so stomach, liver, esophagus problems, kidney disease. Um, you can have a variety of sort of what we call non-specific conditions, so things that might you know, be related to something else can be related to arthritis, like sleep, anxiety, depression, having this kind of brain fog issue that a lot of patients experience, eye problems and lung problems we'll talk about in specific uh, a little bit later. So I'm going to go through a lot of those things one at a time, and I tried to sort of have one picture and a couple of points because there's a lot to, to get through in here. Um, but obesity, we think a lot about in osteoarthritis. So obesity, um, itself probably has a role in causing osteoarthritis in that there's increased load on the joints, but there's also increased inflammation within the body because um, adipose cells and fat cells actually can contribute to a low level of inflammation throughout our body. And that can lead to osteoarthritis. But you can also think of arthritis 
contributing to less activity. So if you're not as active because of arthritis, regardless of type, you may be more uh, likely to develop obesity over time because you're just not able to be active um, and do all the things you'd like to do. Um, so that's kind of this circle that I'm showing here. We have obesity leading to a type of arthritis. Maybe that reduces mobility. That might lead to disability, even more weight gain, even more problems from obesity. And there's also other circles you can draw related to poor sleep, right? So poor sleep can impact pain. You have more pain, can impact activity, can impact obesity, mood disorders you can put in here. So a lot of different things can fit in this cycle that will feed into each other and make that obesity situation even worse through no fault whatsoever of the patient, right? <laughs> there's nothing you can do about this. This is just one of these things that occurs. We will talk, however, about management options. So there are things that we can do together the patient, the provider, a lot of other folks in the healthcare team to try and manage some of these conditions without, you know, laying any blame because there, there isn't any to be laid. Um, so management for obesity certainly includes lifestyle modifications. I bolded that because you will see that over and over and over again. For obesity, that um, is essentially diet, exercise, physical activity, those kinds of things, but it can also be other risk factor modification. And we'll talk about that with some of the other conditions. Obviously people are aware of obesity surgery. There are a lot of new medications around obesity, and this is a, a team uh, decision that you make with your doctor and, and your personal circumstances, because everybody's different, obviously. So cardiovascular disease is a big one, right? We all worry about heart attacks and, and they're, they're a common uh, cause of uh, issues for, well, especially in the United States. Chronic inflammation causes increased cardiovascular risk. So if we think about something like rheumatoid arthritis, if that's chronically active, meaning it's not well controlled by medications, lots of inflamed joints and stiffness, then that is likely a reflection of a chronic active inflammatory state that then increases the cardiovascular risk for that person. Uh, Cardiovascular disease in general is a very frequent cause of excess mortality in a lot of rheumatic disease, RA being a common one. And if you're familiar, there's some risk calculators. You might have gone through one of these with your doctor, like the Framingham Risk Score that sort of counts up you know, your weight and whether you smoke and your family history and things like that. It kind of gives you a probability of having cardiovascular disease. One of the important risk factors is diabetes, which we all kind of know uh, for the most part. But Rheumatoid arthritis is very similar to diabetes in the increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So some calculators even suggest substituting the same risk, additive risk you would get from diabetes with rheumatoid arthritis. Medications can increase risk of cardiovascular disease. So especially NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, naproxen, these kinds of things. There's lots of them, just a couple of exam examples. These are often over the counter. So patients may not even think of them as medications per se, um, because they're not prescribed. But they, uh, especially the non-selective ones, increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. Steroids also increase risk, and that's based on dose, cumulative, uh, and total and uh, daily. Other medications may actually be cardioprotective, whether on their own, like methotrexate, or through reducing disease activity and systemic inflammation, like, for example, biologics and rheumatoid arthritis. Some of the other um, anti-TNFs, for sure, have this feature. Other biologics, there's sort of complexities around, you know, some of them increase cholesterol levels, but don't really increase risk. And so it's not entirely clear for every single drug. Again, our management options are often around lifestyle modifications, smoking cessation being essential here, um, but also diet and exercise, right? Your cardiologist will tell you to reduce caloric intake and increase physical activity in the same way that your rheumatologist will. Obviously, medical treatments mostly to adjust risk factors, right? So if we lower blood pressure, our risk is lower. Reduce cholesterol, risk is lower. And, you know, as always, there are surgical interventions should it get to that point. But usually we're trying very hard to optimize medical management before we get to any surgical management. Next slide, please. Okay, diabetes I've mentioned. So, you know, obviously from what I've already said, I think there's a lot of shared risk factors, right? So if obesity is a risk factor for arthritis and vice versa and diabetes is, is the same, um, so individuals with excess body weight are at higher risk for diabetes. Also aging, so as we age, we have a higher risk for diabetes. That's also the case for obesity and arthritis. So you see these things kind of all start to overlap. 
particularly in things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, some of those conditions, we have to use steroids to control the disease to prevent organ threatening damage. Um, and those steroids themselves, although they're being used for a therapeutic reason, can induce diabetes or can aggravate pre existing diabetes because they cause blood sugar to build up. Um, there's a variety of studies. I just picked one that said about half of people with type 2 diabetes have arthritis. Um, usually that's osteoarthritis, but it can be others. Many have this combination metabolic syndrome, which obesity and high cholesterol and high blood pressure and high gl blood glucose kind of all run together. And then diabetes can also affect us at the cellular level. So if we have high blood sugar all the time, it can actually impact how our cartilage functions, the cartilage metabolism within our joints, and can make arthritis worse. So it's another one of these kind of circles. Um, there's a lot of those, unfortunately, I'll show you some more later. Um, just to be aware, I threw in a few of these along the way, signs and symptoms of, of type 2 diabetes. So this is incredibly common in our society and is only getting more common. So being aware that sort of acute weight loss, not for any particular reason, right? You didn't just go on Weight Watchers or something, you just started losing weight. Being very, very thirsty, being very hungry, um, dry mouth, you know, going to the bathroom a lot, these kinds of things. When they're a big change can be an indication that you need to get, um, get with your doctor and check out what's going on. Again, management, lifestyle modifications, diet, physical activity, uh, weight loss, which can be through those things can also be through other medications or other interventions. And then obviously you're treating the diabetes to lower that sugar burden and some of the additional things that can happen to your joints when you have those high blood sugars and other um, complications like kidneys and, and things that we'll talk about. All right, osteoporosis, this is an interesting one. Um, so osteoporosis is just kind of thinning of the bones. A lot of people have heard of it. It's also quite common. And it's really that the bone mass the, the structure of the bone is reduced and the, the type of bone that's in there is not as strong. So there's less bone and the bone that's there is not as re resistant to fracture. So there's an increased risk of fracture. The risk factors for this are going to sound very familiar, which are increasing age, being a woman, um, in this particular case, being non-Hispanic, white, or Asian background seems to confer increased risk. Having a prior fracture, having a family member with a prior fracture, um, smoking, again, comes up here for osteoporosis. One of the things I find interesting about osteoporosis is it's this bone thinning. It's almost the opposite of osteoarthritis, which is a bone thickening. You make more bone, you form bone spurs, you get sclerosis, you get hardening of bone. Um, but they, they kind of run together anyway, so you can have both osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. And that's different than what we see in rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases, where it seems like it's more of this inflammatory milieu that's running around in the body. Plus, what have we done? We've given steroids again. So steroids are therapeutic, but they have a lot of risk factors. And this is one of the big ones. If you're on high doses of steroids or long duration of steroids, that basically sucks the strength out of the bones directly. So it can decalcify, it can really weaken the bones over time. The higher the dose and the more cumulative dose you're exposed to, the worse. Um, so there are guidelines, which are at the link at the bottom here, uh, for how we should manage what we call glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis or osteoporosis because of steroids. Um, and so at these high doses, um, those are high risk of osteoporosis. So if 30 milligrams a day or more, or more than five grams for a year, then that's considered high risk and is treated in a different way than if the person is at low to moderate risk, which are lower doses over less frequent time. Overall, calcium and vitamin D, along with lifestyle modifications, again, are conditionally recommended for everyone on steroids. But then as the risk goes up, additional interventions are recommended. Smoking cessation is really important here. And physical activity in this case is a little different. So where a lot of individuals with osteoporosis are quite thin and low body weight is actually a risk factor. So physical activity here is to increase impact activity and to strengthen the bones along with medications that can be used for the same purpose. So chronic pain is a big problem. We all see this even just on the news, right? Or reading the news and this is just as common as anything else I've talked about. So one in five Americans in this study, it's about 50 million people. Arthritis is one of the frequent causes of chronic pain. Um, this survey here is from a national health um, sample. So over 
30,000 people, which they can, through survey methodology, cause to represent more than 200 million people. Uh, and you see that, you know, 31 million people are reporting pain every day. 13% of the population has pain every day. Um, and the, the 50 million people are the three most and some very, you know, many less have, less than half have never had everyday pain. That's a sobering statistic to have that much pain. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, untreated pain negatively affects essentially every other aspect of life, but certainly sleep, cognitive function, mood, cardiovascular health, right, is linked to, to sleep and chronic pain, quality of life, obviously. Um, and some of the most common sites are also some of the most common sites that are affected by osteoarthritis and other arthritic types. So back pain, hips, knees, and feet, you know, kind of the things you need to move around and function are places that hurt the most. This is one of the major contributors to the opioid crisis. So, you know, people are in chronic pain, they're not able to do their activities of daily living, they're having poor quality of life, and you know, look for solutions to that. And sometimes those solutions cause more problems than they're probably worth. This obviously contributes to disability, lost productivity. There's a study that says like $80 billion in lost wages from chronic pain. Um, big problem, right? And our arthritis um, interest is tied closely into this. Again, how do we manage that with lifestyle modifications? Why is it in this case? Some of it's the same things, right? Some of it's inactivity and um, excess body weight and those things, but some of it is just the fact that we feel better when we move. And the more we move, or healthy brain chemicals we get working around in there and the better we feel. So it's not just um, the physical aspects of physical activity, it's some of the mental ones as well. Oftentimes, um, some additional strategies are needed to help people cope with pain, to understand you know, what the pain is and how to deal with it and how to function um, despite that pain being there along with physical interventions and sometimes medications. And this is another uh, multidisciplinary aspect of how to manage this. And I'll talk through some of those providers that might be involved in this a little bit later. All right, gastrointestinal disease. So I put this picture here because sometimes we forget how extensive our gastrointestinal system is. So this really can involve anything from the mouth and the salivary glands all the way down the esophagus, stomach, intestines, you know, the, the whole uh, shebang there, as we like to say. So um, these things vary quite a bit, right, where the problem is and how it might be treated. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, is probably the most common thing I hear from my patients that essentially everyone has. Um, so that's irritation from uh, additional acid kind of at the bottom of the esophagus. And that can be exacerbated by medications. Um, aspirin, other uh, NSAIDs, as we discussed earlier, can irritate the esophagus. They can irritate the stomach and cause something called gastritis. Uh, you can get duodenitis, which is further down. So it kind of depends what level that problem is at. Liver damage can be from any cause. A lot of the things we've already talked about can contribute. So obesity can uh, cause fatty deposits in the liver. Um, this is often called steatohepatitis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or um, these kind of, there's, they're kind of complicated words, but essentially it just means there's a little bit too much fat inside the liver. Um, and that can contribute to poor liver function. The liver is necessary to clear a lot of different medications out of our body. And so even if the medication itself is not toxic to the liver, if the liver is not working properly, it may not clear the medication, which then may have other toxic effects. And some medications are directly toxic to the liver. Um, so it's just an important organ to keep in mind because of all the different functions that it has. And there are a lot of different um, enzymes that work in the liver that can um, contribute to medication interactions as well. So that's another reason that people can get into trouble when they're taking multiple medications over the counter or other things that their doctor's not aware of, and those can lead to um, some interactions that can often affect the liver. Pancreatitis is another one. So the pancreas is um, part of its part of the endocrine system and part of it's in the GI tract, but um, pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas can result from some medications. GI bleeding can be a result of that irritation I was just talking about. So reflux is common, GI bleeding is less so, but it's kind of from the same thing that those ulcers get really angry and active and inflamed and they can bleed. 
um, and that can be a concern, particularly for people taking a lot of NSAIDs. Um, and again, the management really depends on where the problem is and why. Um, so there's not sort of a general overall recommendation there other than to make sure you let your doctor know all the medications you're taking, including over-the-counter, including supplements, including herbal things, because um, sometimes there are issues there that you may not think about. Kidneys, again, have a role in clean, clearing out medications from our body. So some things are liver cleared and some things are kidney cleared and some things are kind of a combination of the two. So again, if the kidneys are not working properly, maybe diabetes or high blood pressure can impact the kidney and it's not working right, then it may not clear medications correctly. NSAIDs can cause um, high blood pressure, which can affect the kidneys. They can also directly affect the kidneys. And then I already mentioned this one. So um, sometimes there are medication side effects that prevent that medication from being usable because of kidney disease. So if you have chronic kidney disease, you know, type 3, which is kind of an advanced um, kidney process, then there may be whole classes of medications that cannot be used because the kidneys won't be able to clear that medication. Gout can also directly affect the kidneys. Like those urate crystals will get deposited in there. Um, other comorbidities, as I mentioned. So a lot of things kind of pass through the kidneys and involve the kidneys. Kidney disease can be indicated by a lot of symptoms that are very nonspecific. Right? So you may not realize you may be completely asymptomatic, but this is one of the things that doctors often screen for. You know once or twice a year to kind of make sure the kidneys are working right. They might do a creatinine test or a urine test to see if there are any problems with the kidneys because you see the lit nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, fatigue, not very specific. Um, other probably than swelling. Um, so if you're getting diffuse swelling of your lower extremities, um, that's beyond what you would normally expect, then that might be a, a notice uh, to you that you need to look into that and if your blood pressure is very hard to manage more so than usual and your usual medications aren't really getting at it that can also be related to the kidneys uh, again lifestyle modifications this medication adjustment issue but mainly for the kidneys it's treatment of underlying conditions so reducing blood pressure reducing blood sugar um, managing the kinds of things that are contributing to the kidney damage all right, so we don't want any of these things, right? We, we want to prevent these things. So this is a slide from Movement as Life is another one of these circles. Um, so if we have joint pain, limited mobility, we're not active, we get excess body weight, that increases the pressure on our knee joints. And then you see the little bubbles off to the side and then we're starting to get heart disease and diabetes and depression. So how do we deal with that? What, what can we do? So I've put here, if we click the next one, a little um, physical activity prescription that I use in my clinic. And this is, you know, editable and changeable and people use different ones, but essentially it's a walking prescription. Um, so I talk to my patients about how important physical activity is, how important being not sedentary is. So there's, you know, there's all these physical activity recommendations, like you have to take a 150 uh, minutes of activity or 10,000 steps or all these kinds of, really it's, doing anything is better than doing nothing. So right here, I've got sort of the, the usual 150 minutes filled in, right? So moderate intensity for 30 minutes a day for five or more days. Um, but that's, that's usually the end goal for patients. So when I first meet somebody and give them a prescription like this, um, when they've been relatively inactive and they're having a lot of joint pain, it might say moderate intensity, five minutes, two days a week, or it might say, stand up during the commercials on the TV show until the show comes back on, sit back down. It really depends on where we're starting from and our shared decision making around what the patient's goals are, what this is going to look like. And then it changes every visit. So I might go over this at the next visit and say, okay, how do we do? And then sort of this graded exercise kind of move it up each time to get a little bit more progress and get us closer to our goal, which may never be this 30 minutes, five days a week, or it may start at 30 minutes, five days a week. It really depends what people are already doing. But that's one way uh, to really start the conversation and start getting some things um, under control before it gets to a point where quality of life and activities of daily living are affected. All right, so this one, um, this circle is about rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular disease. It's just another example. Um, of ways that if we manage some of these things, we can reduce complications. So increasing physical activity and adjusting medications and managing these risk factors can really help. So if we look at our little picture here, we have the, the lovely heart in the center 
And this is a heart that is in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, so they're already having the increased risk from that. So we might counsel about tobacco use cessation, right? Quit smoking, really important for RA and for cardiovascular disease. We wanna treat the rheumatoid arthritis, right? It, the closer to remission that is and the longer it can stay in remission, the less inflammation there is and the less that risk is. We wanna minimize risky medications like steroids and NSAIDs we've already talked about. We might wanna choose uh, drugs that we know are protective for cardiovascular disease and rheumatoid arthritis. We definitely want more physical activity. We wanna treat any other conditions that are contributing. So high blood pressure and diabetes, we just talked about, lipids, cholesterol, those are all kind of the same thing. Um, you might be given a statin drug for those kinds of things. So all of these things can help us to reduce that risk. None of these things alone is going to be sufficient. And this is something you have to do along with your doctor because they can't, you know, they're not going to increase your physical activity. That's for the patient to do, but they can help you to, to manage some of these other things and they can give you guidance about how to do the things. So this is a, a topic that comes up a lot, right? Complementary and alternative therapies. The most important thing is that you discuss these with your doctor. So there are certainly doctors that um, don't really have a lot of background in these or maybe don't feel comfortable talking about them. Um, but other doctors certainly are. And all of us need to know if you're taking any of these things. And the reason really is the drug-drug interaction issue. So if you're taking thing that could potentially be toxic to your liver and your doctor sees that you're having liver problems, they might think they need to take you off of an effective therapy that you're on, thinking that's causing the liver trouble when it's really you know, the echinacea you took for your cold three weeks ago or something like that. So just be really open about, these are the things I'm taking, you know, bring a list that includes your prescription medicine, your over-the-counter medicine, and any of these kinds of things you're taking. The other important thing to know is that these are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And the reason that's important, partly there aren't sort of robust clinical trials around their efficacy, but also that it's not necessarily clear what's in them. So you know, it might say it's 100 grams of whatever, but there's no regulatory body that makes them stick to that. So we don't really know how pure the agent is, if there are unnamed inactive ingredients in there. Sometimes there's even contaminants. There have been stories about lead contamination or even arsenic in some of these things. So just being aware that that lack of regulation exists, being open to discuss it with your doctor, and thinking through any potential interactions with them or your pharmacist or whoever's on your care team that you can talk to about this. Um, some specific ones I'll mention, um, glucosamine and chondroitin are always a big topic in osteoarthritis. They are not recommended in most OA guidelines because of a lack of evidence of efficacy. These issues about regulation are there, and they're also fairly expensive, which is one of the common problems with a lot of the supplements that are quite expensive and um, we don't want patients to spend their hard-earned money on things that are not going to help them or may even potentially be toxic. Um, another one that I didn't put on the slide but comes to mind is fish oil. So fish oil is used to reduce cardiovascular disease. There have been a few studies in inflammatory arthritis where it shows maybe a modest benefit. It's certainly not going to treat your RA uh, alone, but it, you know, it might be one that you and your doctor could agree upon as being a potential um, adjunct therapy that could benefit more than one thing. Um, CBD um, is always asked about. So I, I linked to the Arthritis Foundation CBD page because I think it's a really wonderful resource. Um, this is also not regulated. It's also not really well studied. And part of the reason is the legal status is not clear in a lot of states. So a lot of the studies around CBD, particularly for back pain, OA, chronic pain, have been out of Canada. Uh, where the legal status is more clear and it's easier to um, run clinical trials and things. And most of those are still not um, conclusive. Um, some show modest benefit, some show, show not a lot, but um, I would refer you to that Arthritis Foundation website to learn more about that and again, discuss it with your doctor. Acupuncture um, is something that some patients are very interested in and others are not interested in at all. Um, so if you're a person that's interested in acupuncture, um, there is some modest evidence to support that in osteoarthritis and some other types of arthritis. It's very unlikely to cause harm. Um, and, you know, there's always a, a case, but it's generally pretty safe. So if it's something that uh, a patient wanted to try, I usually will encourage them to go ahead and try it uh, for a short period of time 
you know, and agree on what that is. Maybe that's three or six months or however many treatments they want to do. And then come back together and say, look, did, did it really help? Did it not help? Is this something we should continue or not? And that's kind of my usual um, advice around a lot of these things is let's try it for a, a closed ended period of time and just see how it goes and make sure we're not having problems from it. Make sure it's not you know, draining your bank account um, and then make a decision based on that. Another one that comes up a lot are some um, non-standard injectable therapies. So um, injectable steroids are recommended uh, across most guidelines for knee and hip OA. And we use them a lot for um, short-term management of things, you know, really inflamed joints and rheumatoid or gout. That's not this. This is sort of um, non-standard, non-approved injectable therapeutics. So these are like stem cells, which people hear about, uh, PRP, which is also called platelet platelet-rich plasma. These are things you that are available. You can get these things done, but they are not approved. They are not recommended in any of the guidelines, particularly for osteoarthritis, which is where most of the studies have happened. They're very non-standardized. So what you get at one place is completely different than what you might get at another place is completely different than what you might get at another place. And none of the trials are consistent either. The only consistent trial of PRP was recently completed and did not show any benefit. Um, so, you know, Again, I talk to my patients about these things. I've certainly had patients do some of these things, um, but that's sort of the, the overall population level answer is that there's just not enough research, particularly for long-term benefits or risks, right? We don't know what might happen 10 years down the line with these things. Um, so it, it's um, not something that's widely recommended. All right, so this is our team list. I'm sure I missed some, but these are, the ones that came to mind when I was writing the slide. So obviously your primary care provider, whether that's a nurse practitioner, a PA, a family practice, you know, whoever that person is, is sort of the coordinator of these things, right? So if if we're an osteoarthritis patient with five comorbid conditions, we have a lot of doctors, right? And it's really hard to keep all of that straight and to know what to, who does what and where we go. And so our PCP um, is often the person that helps to, you know, direct, right? So kind of be aware of everything that's going on, direct questions to the right person, direct the patient to the right person if that's the case, um, and kind of um, sheriff all that along. Physical and occupational therapy is incredibly important in arthritis, regardless of type, and is vastly underutilized. So some of this is that you know, the doctor's really focused on treating the arthritis and managing the medication end of it and isn't thinking about some of the functional issues. Some of it is access to care and how much it costs to see these folks uh, or see them enough or get to them, right? If we're out in the country and we can't actually get physically to the place multiple times a week for several months on end. Um, but their role is very important in maintaining function and reducing pain and improving fatigue and making sure that we can do all the things we want to do. So physical um, therapists in particular are great for osteoarthritis and weight bearing joints. They can help adjust gait or limb length inequality or biomechanical issues about how a patient is walking and how that might impact their ability to walk or stand or do what they need to do. And occupational therapy can be incredibly important for task specific challenges. Um, so I often refer for hand away or for rheumatoid arthritis that's very deforming in the hands because they have um, gadgets and tricks and all kinds of different ways that can help people to do the things they need to do despite the deformity or the, you know, whatever might be going on in their hands. There are tricks to opening doors and jars and little gadgets to make things easier so that people can live their independent life, can live their mobile life, do the things they want to do, and still, you know, be a functional part of what they want to be involved in and not feel like they're stuck at home and not able to, to do those things. So that's my big pitch for therapy. I think therapy is great. Um, dermatology is the skin doctors, right? So they're really important for skin manifestations like the psoriasis we talked about. I'll talk about another one uh, shortly. Ophthalmology are the eye doctors. These are not the optometrists that do your glasses. These are the medical doctors that take care of your eyes. Cardiology, I mentioned pulmonary are the lung doctors. Endocrinology is often where one would go for medical therapy of osteoporosis or obesity. Gastroenterologists are the folks that do the GI thing, 
right? And they also be your colonoscopy that you need for colon cancer screening. Nephrologists are the kidney doctors. And then obviously there are multidisciplinary teams, particularly for weight and pain management, but for a lot of other things as well. All right, and I was asked to talk about some specific extra articular manifestations of arthritis. So these are not comorbid with arthritis, but rather part of the arthritis process. Um, so we'll talk about interstitial lung disease, inflammatory eye disease, vasculitis, IBD, and a couple of other things. Interstitial lung disease affects a small proportion of rheumatoid arthritis patients, but it can be a very problematic issue. Um, and up to a third of RA patients probably have some subclinical involvement of the lungs. Um, it has an impact on survival. It's under-recognized. Um, and you can see here that it can present first, so people can come into their PCP and then their pulmonologist with interstitial lung disease and be found to have rheumatoid arthritis, or they can come into their rheumatologist with RA and be found to have ILD or anything in between. You can come in all at once, which is usually not a great situation for anybody. And you can see the kind of pathways here. So this is an important direct relationship with rheumatoid arthritis. It can also happen in myositis and some other um, rheumatologic conditions. Again, we wanna focus on risk management with sm stopping smoking, really important. Managing COPD, which is um, chronic obstruction pulmonary disease or emphysema, uh, managing GERD. So reflux can actually contribute to lung symptoms as well. There's so many tie-ins to all the different systems with these. Um, but just be aware if you're having new uh, respiratory problems and you have RA that probably something you at least want to mention to your doctor. Inflammatory eye disease is one I always warn my patients about because who would think that their red eye is related to their arthritis? I probably wouldn't if I didn't have to go to school for it. Um, so you can obviously get pink eye, right? So conjunctivitis or viral infection of your eye. Um, you can get really dry eye, which is the most common thing. But interestingly, you can actually get inflammation of the compartments of the eye with spondyloarthropathies, um, with JIA, with psoriatic arthritis, um, some others. And there's various layers of the eye. You can see some of them marked in the little anatomic image. And all those different layers can be affected. So the ophthalmologist can tell, is this inflammation in the back layer? Is this in the middle? Is this in the front? And that can vary quite a bit based on the treatment. But even dry eye can be so severe as to be vision uh, harming and requires ophthalmology care. And dry eye is extremely common in inflammatory arthritis conditions. So um, if your eyes are bothering you, make sure you tell your rheumatologist or your PCP or just go see the eye doctor for that. Vasculitis is a weird one. Um, I get asked about it a lot. There's a lot of things that cause vasculitis. Those are on the left. Those are all the scary inflammatory things. They're inc incredibly rare. The mimics of vasculitis, the top uh, right side of the slide, are much more common, right? So infections and drug reactions and um, other things are, are more likely than actual inflammatory vasculitis. But the most common thing I see as a rheumatologist is a thing called leukocytoclastic vasculitis, which is these red blotchy things on these limbs down here. And that's really a skin biopsy thing that, again, is almost always due to drug or infection or some other thing. Um, and it's just, it's not a specific finding. So vasculitis is one of those things that you really have to, to talk to your doctor about and understand. And different specialties use the word in different ways. Um, I would also say if you get a strange looking rash that isn't going away and you don't remember a bug bite or getting into poison ivy, that you should probably talk to your uh, doctor about that as well, because it could be one of these many things. Inflammatory bowel disease, I wanted to mention, because this is not irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, so irritable bowel syndrome is in the little orange box. That's the common thing. It's on TV a lot. It's kind of pain and diarrhea and constipation that alternate and they come and go. And um, people go through lots of tests to have IBS, and there are medications to manage that. Um, but that is not the same as inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which really are damaging the interior lining of the gut um, and cause uh, systemic manifestations like we've talked about of the joints and the skin and the eyes and other organs. Um, and people can get involvement anywhere along the gut. Um, and the activity of the condition can be independent of the gut. So you can have 
terrible uncontrolled ankylosing spondylitis symptoms and have your gut disease very well controlled, or you can have out of control Crohn's disease and have arthritis that won't respond to treatment. So they don't act together necessarily um, and other aspects do, but just to keep the idea that irritable bowel syndromes, more of these symptoms and diarrhea, constipation kind of stuff, whereas inflammatory bowel disease is a more systemic, serious condition, um, can have you know really massive bloody stools and a lot of other problems that go along with that. Those two things are very different. The nervous system, there's a lot of nonspecific things, right? So we all get headaches and fatigue, weakness can happen, but there are some more concerning ones. Um, peripherally, right? So out in the fingers and toes, Neuropathy is quite common, but it's complex. There are a lot of reasons people get neuropathy, diabetes being a very common one. There are also vitamin and nutritional deficiencies. There certainly are some autoimmune causes and definitely something you wanna to talk to your provider about. And there are some other toxins that can contribute to that. So essentially neuropathy, like having numb feet and numb hands, you have to kind of go through this whole workup to really figure out what the cause of that is. Sometimes there's just a local problem, like carpal tunnel in the right hand or a, you know, one toe that's numb or something like that, that often can be from compression or from damage to a single nerve, which is a different issue and often a mechanical issue. In the central nervous system, so not out at the limbs, but kind of the whole nervous system, the thing we see the most is the centralized pain issue. I put a lot of different names for it here. You may have heard some or all of these. Centralized pain, pain sensitization, there's central pain sensitization, amplified pain syndrome, which is often used in kids, fibromyalgia. Those are all really referring to the same thing, which is this oversensitivity to pain of the nerves, not of the person. It's not that the person is too sensitive to pain. It's that their body is telling them that things are painful when they shouldn't be. So light touch is perceived as pain or you know, somebody bumping into your leg is perceived as acute pain. And that pain is sending all the danger signals that pain is supposed to send, but from an inappropriate initial uh, cause. And there's a really great Arthritis Foundation site on centralized pain as well, which I put there. Lifestyle modifications, again, are really important here. Um, so staying physically active, keeping our uh, mental health as optimal as we can. And then certainly there are medications symptomatically for these. There's not medications that solve these problems. So these are things that are being treated symptomatically and then trying to take away the initial uh, factor that caused it to happen. Just a couple things to worry about, right? <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but my patients often um, are, are very concerned about symptoms and some of those symptoms they should be and some of them they shouldn't. Um, so these are just the three little panels from the CDC. The top one is stroke, right? So if there's face droop, one arm is falling down, speech is slurred, you know, you might be having a stroke and you need to go to the emergency room. Heart attack is the next one down, right? Chest pain, shortness of breath, we kind of all know about these. In women, it's more often um, not as dramatic and can be more nausea and vomiting kinds of symptoms. So just kind of being aware of sudden onset, right? These are not things you've had for six months. These are new things that happen and are different from the usual things. And then sepsis at the bottom is another uh, of the top five or so causes of death in the United States. So I put this one on there too. This is usually infection related. Um, so really fast heart rate, really bad fever, being confused, shortness of breath. You know, these are things that are happening. These are things to talk to your doctor immediately about. Um, but it can sometimes be difficult to know which things are serious. Um, certainly the things that I just showed you that might be related to your arthritis might not be obvious, right? Having eye pain that's acute. Didn't know you needed to call your rheumatologist about that, I bet. Um, having diarrhea with psoriatic arthritis might be a sign that there's inflammatory bowel disease overlap. New cough and shortness of breath in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis might indicate ILD, or it might be an infection, or it might be pneumonia, right? But it's something that needs to be looked at. New rash or numbness and tingling could be neuropathy, could be vasculitis, could be one of these other conditions related to medications. You know, so these are all things to, to let your doctor or your care team know. All right, so here's our circle again, lots of kinds of arthritis, lots of kinds of comorbid conditions. Prevention and management is key. Physical activity and lifestyle modifications are the main way to do that. These are multidisciplinary conditions. They affect lots of different organs, lots of different aspects of a patient and need to be addressed as such. And there are a variety of resources that will be uh, discussed, uh, I think, after the Q&A.
Um, we did receive several questions. I would have actually say hundreds of questions before this webinar and several during the webinar. So please be patient. I'll try to um, get, <laughs> try to have answer as many of them as possible with Dr. Nelson. But if you do not get your questions answered, just know that um, we do have a helpline here, um, arthritis.org slash helpline. Um, and without further ado, let's get into the Q&A. So Dr. Nelson, um, we, had, we had one um, audience member say, you talked a lot about the supplements and types of alternative treatments that do not work. Are there any that you would recommend that, that do work or that you, you've seen in your own practice that have some modestly benefit, beneficial side effects and that are worth the money? <laughs> like the little add-on and that are worth it. Um, I have had patients uh, swear by acupuncture. I've had other patients say it did nothing. So I think it's a very, you know, these things that don't have sort of population level efficacy kind of suggest that there's probably subgroups of people that they work for and subgroups that they won't. And it's, unfortunately, we don't yet know who those people are. So the only way to find out is really to, to give it a shot. But that's why I always put kind of boundaries around it. So I say, let's do this, depending what it is, how long it's supposed to take, three months, six months, you know, let's try it, let's do it, let's see how it goes, um, as long as it's safe and doesn't interact with your other medications. Um, and if, if somebody tells me that that has changed their life and it works great, then it works great. And I don't care what the randomized clinical trial says. But if, you know, I don't really have any evidence to say on a big level, it's gonna work. And they tell me, eh, it's not that big of a difference. Then I say, save your money and move on. So unfortunately it's a little bit trial and error, but just make sure that your doctor agrees that it's safe before you choose to do things like that. Uh, one question we have here, can OA sometimes have inflammatory episodes? And if, if so, um, how can you tame those inflammatory episodes and flares in OA? Are they different than inflammatory arthritis or is it more the same? Yeah, I love that question. I did not plant that question. So okay. there's, there's a bunch of different ways to think about this. So arth osteoarthritis can be a little bit more inflammatory some days than others. People with what we call erosive OA, the ones that have really deformed hand joints can get even almost gouty, like really inflamed knuckles sometimes. And it turns out it's related to osteoarthritis. Additionally, a lot of people with osteoarthritis have something called calcium pyrophosphate disease or CPPD, which is also called pseudogout. And it's a kind of crystal, not the uric acid crystal, it's calcium pyrophosphate crystal, that, that can also deposit in the joints. And so people can get flares from CPPD that's overlying their osteoarthritis. So that to say, yes, you, there's absolutely an inflammatory component to osteoarthritis, depends on the joint, depends on the type, all these things. Um, sometimes I'm able to get people through that with a short course of NSAIDs. So I talked a lot about bad things with NSAIDs, but they're great sometimes in the short term. So if I need to calm something down, I can use those for a week or two at the lowest dose that works and then get rid of them so that we're not on them chronically. I might inject a single joint, you know, with steroids to calm one joint down if it's really just isolated to one place. Um, so there certainly are ways to deal with that that your doctor can help you with. Excellent. Um, we have one uh, a viewer here asking, besides a primary care physician, who else should you see for the management of OA? Can you see a rheumatologist, um, orthopedic surgeon? So there, there's a lot of choices. Those certainly are choices. Rheumatologists tend to be really hard to get into um, because there are not, there's a, a known shortage of rheumatologists and we have um, you know, backups of people with RA and uh, lupus and things that primary care doctors simply can't manage. So um, it's often hard to see a rheumatologist with OA, but orthopedics, especially non-operative orthopedics or even sports medicine, which is an offshoot of family practice, can often be very useful for things, you know, kind of working through the guidelines, but injections and referrals and those kinds of things as well. Uh, physical therapists sometimes do a lot of the management piece of this. Um, especially if people are, you know, really motivated to make some of those lifestyle changes, that can be a good uh, touchstone. Um, there are even, um, what are they called? I forget the name. There's like lifestyle specialists in medicine now that is sort of a field of its own that does holistic management and um, risk factor modification. Functional medicine doctors, is that? Yeah, yeah. So any number of people um, can help with osteoarthritis. And it mostly is just about establishing rapport and having someone that you trust and 
can work through some of these things with you and it doesn't necessarily matter as much what their specialty is. Uh, we have one question here about um, going back to problems in the eyes. Is it advisable to use eye drops uh, with uh, uveitis or with pain in the eyes? And if so, what kind of eye drops should you use? The, if it's the first time that eye pain is presenting that way, whatever it is. Um, so you never had dry eye before and now you do, or you've never had a big red painful eye before and now you do. Um, you know, those are things to see the ophthalmologist for first to see what's going on, because there are a lot of things that can go on in that tiny little globe and some of all that picture that I showed. So there can be corneal ablations on the outside surface. There can be inflammation on the white surface of the eye. There can be inflammation in the back of the eye. Some of those things drops are used for, some of them they're not. Um, so I would first make sure um, the, the cause and that the right thing is being done. In general, for dry eye, which is the most common thing, the natural tears without preservatives are often what people do. And you can do those multiple times a day to try to keep the eye lubricated, but not uh, put any medication in there. Like you just wanna replace the tear film that isn't there, but you don't wanna put a bunch of stuff in there that might actually irritate the eye. Can stomach problems be related? I think we, we already discussed this, but stomach problems be related to arthritis. We, we did discuss that. Now, we have a question here that says, does IBD associated arthritis always manifest like a spondyloarthritis? And if not, how else might, might it display? Yeah, that's the most common pattern. So a lot of the things I chose to talk about are sort of the most common patterns. You can obviously have osteoarthritis or gout or a lot of these other things in conjunction with IBD as well. But the most common pattern is to have a spondyloarthropathy kind of picture. And that's usually what we're getting referrals from GI for to rheumatology is they'll refer IBD patients with Crohn's or UC that have new inflammatory back pain or new um, digit swelling, what we call dactylitis. Um, so, you know, most typical that anything can happen. We always, for rheumatologists, anything can happen. Uh, we've had several uh, questions about Sjogren's syndrome. Diane, one of our viewers asked, how is Sjogren's syndrome related? I have moderate osteoarthritis, um, but I have an element of psoriasis, and I was diagnosed with uh, idiopathic uh, interstitial lung disease um, and Sjogren's syndrome. Um, how, how are all those related, and, and are they? And if so, yeah. she's, she's uh, I'm assuming, um, and after she's uh, also on a course of steroids and now a Plaquenil, and she's improved, and she wants to know um, what else helps with Sjogren's flare-ups. Yeah. So Sjogren's is a tough one. Um, so the prototypical symptoms of Sjogren's are really dry eye and really dry mouth, but you can also get lung involvement, arthritis, um, a lot of other uh, features. So it, even nerve system problems with Sjogren's. So we see it a lot in conjunction with rheumatoid arthritis, you have rheumatoid and secondary Sjogren's. We see it by itself, which is primary Sjogren's, and we can see it in combination with some of the other autoimmune diseases. Um, but it's also very nonspecific. So it depends on how the diagnosis is made, whether it's antibodies or whether a biopsy is done. Um, the trouble with Sjogren's is there are really no specific therapies for it. Um, so a lot of the management of Sjogren's is around eye drops that we talked about, um, sugar-free lozenges and other ways to increase salivary pooling. There are a couple of medications that will increase um, saliva, saliva production. There we go. Um, but generally, you know, and we'll try to use Plaquenil in cases of arthritis and stuff, but there's not like a biologic that treats Sjogren's as yet, although there are many in clinical trials. It's one of the hot areas in rheumatology research right now. So hopefully we'll have something better soon. Awesome. Uh, we have a, a few questions about heart disease. Um, one person asked, is heart disease, heart disease inevitable if you have an autoimmune form of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis? And um, if you are able to get your rheumatoid arthritis under control, does your risk also go down? And I think that we, or you did discuss that, but is it is it inevitable even if your arthritis is con controlled or is having it controlled, does that eliminate the risk of heart disease? 
Yeah. So unfortunately, it's just one factor, right? So we're all at some risk for heart disease. It's one of the most common killers in, in the country, unfortunately, still, um, although it's gone down a little bit. Um, and so those risks are, are multiple. There's genetic risks. There's you know, lots of different reasons, diet and medications and things. But to the extent that rheumatoid arthritis is contributing to cardiovascular risk, the more under control it is or longer, the less that additional risk is. So if your RA is in remission on therapy and you can keep it that way for 10 years, then you're dramatically lowering your overall cardiovascular risk. It doesn't go to zero. It probably goes back to what it was before you had rheumatoid arthritis um, and is still impacted by all those other risk factors, but it certainly helps. And it's um, something that most of us can achieve with current uh, therapy for RA. And this is our last question. We had several questions about exercise. Um, I just also want to plug that we did have an exercise webinar in April, so you can check out that recording on arthritis.org slash webinars um, for all those questions about uh, exercise modifications. But um, there's several people that want to start an exercise routine, but they, they feel as though they're in more pain the next day or they're afraid they'll cause more pain. Um, when do you know when to push through that pain versus to stop? Um, and in your, uh, your opinion, what's the best kind of exercise to start out with if you're trying to, because I know exercise was indicated for all of these uh, of the management. So if you're just trying out, what, what do you recommend to start with and what's your recommendations around uh, working through the pain? So I always talk to patients about their preferences here. So some people, terrified of water, right? I'm not going to recommend aqua therapy to somebody that's terrified of water. Some people, you know, have certain equipment or don't have access to certain equipment. The easiest thing is walking. So I generally start with walking and I often, you know, like I said, it might be five minutes. It might be walking to the mailbox where we have been driving to the mailbox, standing up more than sitting down. It really depends where we start from, but wherever your starting place is. So if you're a person that maybe walks 10 or 15 minutes, three days a week, Maybe you walk 20 minutes, four days a week. You know, you kind of bump it up a little bit every time. Or if you're pretty, pretty good with walking, but you get um, short of breath or a little overexerted with um, additional activity, maybe you start doing an elliptical. Maybe you walk, you know, on an elliptical and that gives you a little bit more cardiovascular exercise. If your joints are really painful or excess body weight is a major problem, sometimes water therapy is really good because the added buoyancy allows the joints to move without putting so much of the gravitational pressure on them, um, if, if that's accessible and things. But sometimes it just comes down to what you like to do. Because if you're doing something you dislike, then it's a chore and you don't maintain that. Whereas if you're doing something that you at least enjoy some, I mean, none of us really want to exercise all the time, but if you kind of enjoy it and it's not a big burden and it's not a huge cost, then you're much more likely to stay with that program and staying with it and maintaining it is the most important thing. So you want to pick something you can afford, you can access and that you don't hate to do so that you're able to do it, you know, to an amount that's actually going to benefit you. That's a great answer. Um, Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing such uh, incredible depth of knowledge. I, I, I think everybody on this call learned something of value to keep themselves healthy um, and hopefully help prevent some of these uh, related conditions. So thanks so much and take care and hopefully you'll join us for another webinar. Great, thank you so much. So before we sign off for the night, I do want to share some resources that uh, we have here at the Arthritis Foundation. So the first um, is starting off with our California Coast Classic. Um, it's a signature Arthritis Foundation event. Um, it's going to be from September 30th through October 7th, um, and limited spaces are available. So please make sure if you want to join that you head over to uh, arthritis.org slash California Classic. All right. And if you didn't know already, we have um, connect groups to be, help you get supported with other folks with arthritis um, and learn more about positive coping strategies to uh, support your health, disease management, and mood. Um, we have several coming up in July, so uh, be sure to check out connectgroups.arthritis.org. If you enjoyed tonight's webinar, uh, Minus the technical difficulties we had earlier, I, I welcome you to join us uh, every month. We have a monthly webinar. We will take a break in July due to the uh, J 
JA Family Summit, but we will resume our webinars starting with Living Well with Gout. Experts will share disease tips on how to uh, control gout flares, um, get to remission, and live better and more pain-free. And then following um, on August 23rd, we'll have our school solutions with JA. This is for uh, parents and caretakers of children with juvenile arthritis. Um, you'll learn from an educational rights attorney, uh, various accommodations, and uh, ways that you can ensure that your child has everything they need to succeed um, in school. Next, we have our Walk to Cure Arthritis um, events. It's walk season. Um, there are still events that are happening all over the country. So uh, to find one near you, um, go to arthritis.org slash WTCA. If you haven't, I highly suggest that you uh, listen to our podcast. It's a great way to, to learn uh, more about disease management um, hosted by patients. So real talk, real candid talk about um, what it's like to live with arthritis and more management tips. And like I mentioned before, I know that we didn't have time to answer everyone's questions, but um, if you still have a question, please head over to our helpline. The number's on the screen and uh, the uh, URL is arthritis.org slash helpline. The survey, we will send a post-event survey next week with a recording of this event. So if you have any uh, questions or uh, if you have any feedback, please let us know. It helps us shape and mold future events so that we can best serve you in the future. Lastly, we do have uh, a new uh, series, a new in-person series for uh, educational and disease management um, called Living Well Events. They're happening locally all throughout the country. Topics range from disease management to life hacks to pain management, and we're kicking those off. Um, in Milwaukee, DC, and LA on um, July 15th, 20th, and 25th. So if you're interested in attending any of those in-person events, and if you don't have gout, if you have another type of arthritis or interested in uh, the other events that we offer, please go to um, arthritis.org slash livingwell. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Bo Ringer Ingelheim, uh, for providing this, the support to make this event possible. And with that, I'll say good evening, um, good night, and thanks so much for joining us and hope to see you next time.